I'm J.R. Butler, co-founder of The Shift Group, and you're listening to Merchants of Change. This is a podcast about transferring the skills and behaviors we acquire as athletes into being a professional technology salesperson. Each week, we'll introduce you to a top performer who will help us understand how they became professional merchants of change. What's up, kid? How we doing, Mike? Excellent. Excellent, JR. How are you? Good, man. I'm excited, everyone. We got Mike Davis on the show. Mike, thank you for being on the show today, man. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah. So, so for context, uh, for those first listening and, and for you, Mike, um, Merchants of Chains is a show that's really for new sellers and people who are kind of considering that career shift into, into sales. And our mission at Shift Group, uh, who I guess is our, our sponsor for Merchants of Change, um, is to help athletes and military veterans become elite sales professionals. And to date, we have focused uh, very, very specifically on B2B technology sales careers. But as you know, we are getting into kind of the medical and pharmaceutical verticals now. Um, so this is going to mark our first episode with someone who is an expert in a, in a field outside of tech, in, in your case, medical seal, sales um, specifically, right? Um, all of our guests are former athletes uh, who have found or veterans who have found success in sales. So we always like to start with kind of that first career. Um, so this is a, a very broad question intentionally, but can you just talk about like what some of your favorite memories are from from your football days? Oh gosh, yeah, so many. It's it's unbelievable. I, you know, uh, playing uh, playing college football was was uh, was awesome. It was a dream of mine as a kid. Um, you know, and actually, I actually what I really wanted to be, I wanted to be in the NFL. Uh, and when I got to college, I realized that that was a a leap that I uh, just maybe wasn't quite prepared to make. Um, and so I signed on at West Virginia Wesleyan College. Uh, a, a Division II school in the hills of West Virginia. Uh, head coach uh, Will, uh, Bill, uh, Bill Struble, uh, you know, signed me on, and and uh, actually had a chance to learn under him. And also a fellow named Brian Joswiak. He was he was actually the number I think he was the number six pick in the overall in the draft in 1986 for the Chiefs. He was a lineman, all American, out of West Virginia University. He was our O line uh, O line coach. And anyway, just signing on, and and I thought I'd be a a big fish in a little pond, you know, coming from Florida. I was uh, I was at a six A school there, you know, did pretty well at uh, Bloomingdale, and then and then went up to West Virginia. And I thought it'd be a big fish, a little pond. Uh, turns out the first day of uh, of uh, we had three a days back then. It's back in 1995, uh, and uh, turned out that first day we actually had the Dolphins, the Steelers, and I think the um, uh, who else was there? I think it was the uh, um, might have been the Chiefs. But anyway, all the three NFL teams were there looking at our tight end one of our tackles and one of our wide receivers. And I was like, wow, this is not a little pond. This is the real deal. And so division two football was, was, uh, um, was, uh, a, a, a great leap from high school for sure. But you know, the camaraderie with the fellas, the locker room, uh, you know, the road trips, uh, getting in the game, making memories, you know, great plays, negative plays, marginal plays, whatever, just those memories, you know, have kept me and, and various, uh, uh good friends of mine, lifelong friends connected over the years been uh, been awesome everybody uh always mentions the locker room it's it's yeah. it's literally i think like the first thing i think of when i think of my sports career it's like to just be you get to you get to hang out with your friends like all day it's it's yeah. the best um and play a when, game. You, when you look back at like some of your yeah exactly when you look back at some of your favorite teammates um at west virginia west wesleyan what like what traits and characteristics like come to mind for you? Any anyone that you would like shout out, shout out specifically? Oh, gosh, so so many. It'd be hard hard to. I, I, it's a dangerous game, right? Once I name someone and I fail to name someone else, it's like, hey, I didn't mean anything to you, so it's hard. Yeah. But I, but I guess I you know I'll simply say you know, <laughs> I, when I was a recruit, um, uh, I was a senior in high school. Um, uh, my host was Mark Fair. Uh, he became my college roommate. Uh, that first year, and then we were roommates all the way through his graduation. Uh, he actually is a uh, is very uh, uh, in tune with the 
Booster Club at Maslin High School in Maslin, Ohio. You know, they have an annual uh, game, Maslin McKinley, which was featured in Sports Illustrated back in the 90s. Just a high school game, but it's right there where the uh, the uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame is. And so so uh, Mark Fair is somebody that just meant, meant a lot to my to my uh, my life, you know, both as a footballer and then, of course, even after. Uh, Adam Martini, uh, he was my center uh, and also one of my roommates. Uh, Luke Richlick was a strong safety of ours and good friend of mine. He looks like, he looks like Popeye, you know, big, big guy, you know, real, you know, just, just, uh, you, know, you know, just, just, we, that's what we called him. But anyway, Luke Richlick's one of those guys and Paul Fadigate, yep. uh, Jason Dawson, Kevin Titch and all of that, you know, he goes, goes on and on. Scott Gasper, yeah, actually Scott Gasper was, uh, was the quarterback that, um, that he made his debut my redshirt year. He actually was a redshirt freshman and, um, and I, I signed there behind him and then a guy that was a redshirt sophomore. Well, anyway, Scott Gasper went in in the fourth game due to an injury to the starter, and that was, and he never left. He ended up being an eventual All-American. I actually didn't start as a QB until my fifth year because of Scott Gasper. He was, he was amazing. Wow. He actually is now leading, leading uh, uh, recruiting for ECU's football team, uh, the ECU Pirates, and uh, I was in touch Very with cool. him just recently as nice. well. So there's, there's, just, there's so many people, Zach Kilburn, um, um, Raphael Dowdy. I mean, there's Mo Cooper, Justin Klimchak. I mean, there's just there's just so many names of, of people. I, 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 sorry, everybody, I didn't mention. There's so many of you, but uh, good times, good times indeed. Absolutely. Um, how do you think your uh, your teammates would describe you from your playing days, Mike? Um, intense. You know, I was I was I was the kind of like that um, <laughs> that that uh, that intense quarterback that that couldn't wait to throw a block. You know, couldn't wait to you know, to, uh, to go down there and hit somebody. I hated throwing an interception, but if I did, I wanted to be the guy that just lit somebody up, you know, cause it was my responsibility. Um, you know, and, and, uh, I don't know, I mean, they, intense with for sure. I mean, you know, and I would, I mean, I, I was intense doing my homework. I was intense walking across campus, you know, and, you know, you name it, but, uh, we, we had a blast. They'd say I was intense. You know, I, I, um, I actually, I, I cause I sat it. the bench, uh, you know, for so many years as a QB, I wound up getting in at different, um, different positions. I played some long snapper. Um, and, um, also I played some wide out my third year, bless you, played some uh, wide out as well. So I was able to get on in on the field, you know, different positions, uh, just, uh, just got six, three, you know, I can run pretty decently, you know, can catch a ball the whole nine. So, so I had a chance to, to play in different, different places, but intense would be probably the way they would, they would describe me for sure. Just just knowing you as as short of a time as I, I have, I, I, I think I, I probably agree with the intensity and I love it. Now, I'm like a big believer. I have a tattooed on my body that how you do anything is how you do everything. So that yeah. doesn't surprise me. Um, and just a little nugget. I so I I'm known as a hockey player, but I played I was a captain of my my high school football team and I had to play quarterback my junior year because our PG uh, ended up going to college and I used to get yelled at by my coach because I would, we would do sweeps and I, I would end up being the lead blocker. Like I, <laughs> I, I'd lateral the ball and then I'd run out and try to cut block one of the cornerbacks or, or safeties. And he used to scream at me. He's like, dude, you're not, he's like, you are the quarterback, JR. We don't have a backup. You need to stop doing that. Yeah. My helmet had more, had more marks on it than like our fullback did. <laughs> Um, when, when you look back at your football career, Mike, like what's the accomplishment you think you're most proud of? Yeah. You know, it's, it's a hard one. We, um, you know, the, the year I started my fifth year, we weren't, uh, very, we weren't extremely successful. I, you know, record of two and eight, uh, you know, we, we were competitive, uh, but just weren't able to get over the hump. Most of those games, uh, I think the accomplishment really is, is, um, it, for me is, is, uh, is one of, um, uh, tenacity. You know, I was I was a tenacious guy. I mean, you know, sitting on the bench. Uh, I didn't I didn't actually get into a game till my third year. Um, you know, so so riding it out, uh, dealing with the grind. You know, uh, still building relationships with the with the boys, um, learning the offense, getting better at the offense. Um, you know, uh, you know, getting better at reading defenses, dissipating the whole nine, all while knowing I wasn't going to see the field for a long time. You know, and so I think the greatest accomplishment was sticking to it. Um, and then, of course, you know, I was proud to be to be a captain you know, in my fifth year, you know, as a fifth year senior uh, of, of the squad. And, um, and and we had some fun. You know, we we lost more games than we won. But my proudest accomplishment is is is, um, is the tenacity around uh, sticking with it. I, you know, I know that, you know, there's there's so many and maybe that's part of the culture these days. If, if you don't like your situation, you know, with a transfer portal, you can just leave. 
you know, back then you couldn't do that. Your, your choice was stick it out or quit, right? And so I'm obviously not a quitter. Uh, so the, the, the goal was to stick it out, you know, and, and to, to honor my commitment I made to the school. Uh, and, it, and it rewarded me, uh, you know, with some financial help to get through school, but also uh, the opportunity to get on the field and, and lead the team into battle uh, on a day-in, day-out basis my fifth year. So uh, that, I think that's my proudest accomplishment. Yeah, I think we could probably do a whole episode on the transfer portal and and how that's impacting uh, mindsets. But um, so your fifth year, you're a captain, right? Um, we always joke, right? Like you just can't wait to get into a sales job, right? Most people like me uh, kind of trip and fall into it. Um, so tell me a little bit, Mike. We've never talked about this. How'd you how'd you end up in sales? And were there other career paths? that you were exploring at the time? Yeah, yeah, good, good question. Um, you know, I, the, 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 uh, the short story, uh, the long story made short is um, uh, getting out of college, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I had actually a couple of offers to get into home construction as a production supervisor. Uh, Northern Virginia, Ryan Holmes was one of them. I actually flew to Charlotte for an interview. My job would be to supervise various teams building houses, right? That was kind of neat. Uh, a few other potential opportunities you know, in different different areas. Uh, but um, my my future brother-in-law, my, my sister's husband, he was in recruiting. And he said to me, he said, Mike, get out of school, come down to Orlando, live with me. I'll charge you nothing in rent. We, uh, we'll have a good time playing PlayStation, going to bars, hanging out, whatever. But I can get you a job with Enterprise Rent-A-Car. He said, you, you'll get exposed to sales, management, all the way from ordering toilet paper for the bathroom, all the way to, you know, managing multi-million million dollar fleet of vehicles, you know, and, and, and obviously you'll, you'll, you'll start on, you know, as a, as a management trainee, everybody goes to the management program there uh, and you'll get exposed to all these things uh, and you'll see what, what goes from there. And then, you know, and I said, well, geez, I don't know that I really want to rent cars for a living. He said, Mike, you're not going to rent cars for a living. You're going to get in somewhere, learn what you like to do, figure out where you're, what you're good at. And then a year or two years, three years, You'll wind up with another job that's more in direct in line with what you want to do. And it was outstanding advice because I had no idea what I wanted to do. What I realized when I got to Enterprise is I was actually pretty good at managing, um, you know, chaotic situations. I was good at, at selling. We had to sell the damage waiver. We had to, you know, try to upsell people. If they, if they reserved a Geo Metro, we had to try to upsell them into a Cavalier or a Fort Taurus or whatever it was to try to get a little more money out of the reservation, whatever the case. And I was, I realized pretty early on, I was, I was good at all those things, you know, and I was able to work my way up. Actually, I had uh, three promotions uh, within an 11 month period um, at enterprise and here I'm 22 years old. Um, and so, so then from there, I got into healthcare sales, uh, getting onto a company called Ameticis. It was a, a life science firm focused on home healthcare. Um, so I was, that was where I began calling on physicians. And I did that for a year. I realized that going in and out of doctor's offices was a lot of fun, you know, having conversations where I could learn things from the doctors. I could also educate them on certain things about a medicine that, that uh, might help their practice, help their workflow, help their patients heal a little more quickly with maybe a little bit more of an improved clinical track towards, towards uh, home health care, whether it's occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, you know, physical therapy, whatever. And so from there, um, my, my father, who's a retired Marine Colonel, uh, he actually, uh, after uh, he um, retired from the Marine Corps, he began a, a second career teaching Marine ROTC at Clearwater High School. Um, and uh, he did that for 19 years, did it extremely successfully. Um, you know, he, he was he was a successful Marine, uh, a full bird colonel. Uh, he flew uh, President Reagan and uh, President Carter in the HMX-1 presidential helicopter. So he's got stories for days on that. You know, get a beer or two in him and He'll just go to town on stories of, of being at Camp David with Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. There's one story where, um, where, where uh, he tells where, where Jimmy invited the Marines to the presidential barracks at, at Camp David. And he is uh, literally physically with a ladle serving the Marines chicken soup, you know, as they're as they're they're having dinner. And, you know, my dad recalls it, or he's thinking to himself, heck, I'm 31 years old. and I'm here at Camp David with the president of the United States. He said, Life, life's pretty good. Anyway, uh, to tie that story together, um, he he taught a person uh, in his Marine Junior ROTC at Clearwater um, who was a little bit of a troubled person. And uh, that person's mom was in for the pharmaceutical landscape uh, at Eli Lilly at the time. And she said, Colonel, you've done so much with my son. 
I've seen such a transformation since he's been in your junior ROTC. Uh, I'd love to help you. Is can I help your son or daughter? And he said, Well, my son, he's 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 doing some home health care sales. He'd love to get into pharma. Uh, can you help him? And and so uh, she did. So there was nothing at Eli Lilly at the time, but she had a friend at a company called Wyeth, which is now owned by Pfizer. Um, and, uh, and that person said, Yeah, we have an opening in Orlando. You know, would your would your contact be willing to move to Orlando? I was living in uh, Winter Haven at the time, just about. 45 minutes, maybe an hour south. And I said, sure, I would. So I interviewed, got the job, and that's where pharma sales took off in 2002. Um, but ultimately, based on kind of your question, you know, ultimately, I, I realized early I had a propensity for sales. I realized early that healthcare was a great place. You know, healthcare is insulated from a lot of the ups and downs of the country, of the economic market. I mean, there are, there are always going to be people and there are always going to be ailments and pharmaceuticals and medical treatments are always going to have a reason for being. So, so I chose pharma to be a place for me. Um, and what I realized, you know, now, shoot, 21 years later, uh, it's been an extremely great ride, a great decision, a great place to truly impact people's lives, you know, and, and really in some cases, saving lives, you know, and when, when people put medication inside their bodies, you know, they expect a result, you know, when they get a result that's better than they anticipated, knowing I had, I had a hand in that, um, is, uh, is, truly a rewarding experience. Um, so, um, yep. well, good stuff. Yep. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and you kind of answered my next question, which, you know, we've, we've only talked to people, uh, in technology sales. So like, you know, you hit on a lot of the things that, you know, I've, I've always had in my, in my mind that we would expand, uh, horizontally into these other verticals with medical being like literally number one, right? I saw a stat the other day, that on average, Americans spend about 4% of their total take-home income on, on pharmaceuticals, right? So it's a, it's a massive, massive market, just like tech is, right? And, and, and I think people who work in tech live in a little bit of a bubble, um, not really realizing uh, what the opportunity is. So I'm, I'm really excited about this. Um, one question I was curious about is you talked about why the career is great. Can you talk a little bit about why, like, athletes and veterans specifically um, tend to tend? I mean, the the data is clear, right? They tend to be like really successful in it. Like, so what what about it makes it a great career specifically for athletes and veterans? Yeah, got, great question, Jr. You know, that's a, I, I'm going to answer it. It's a twofold answer. Uh, so, so number one, if you're a an elite athlete. You didn't wake up one day and just be an elite athlete. You had to work for it. Um, you know, you had to you had to get up every day. You know, go to practice. You had to be biased towards improvement at your practice. Otherwise, you wouldn't have become an elite athlete. You also had to do things outside of practice uh, and outside of the weight room and outside of structured team time. Uh, you had to you had to you know be careful what you put into your body. You had to make sure you eliminated you know um, bad habits. Uh, to be an elite athlete. So you had to really be, you know, in everything you did, you had to be biased towards improving your craft to be an elite athlete. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, in, in my, as a quarterback, obviously more accurate in throwing, quicker on the drop, um, you know, better reading defenses, better anticipating the blitz, you know, looking at where, you know, potential opportunities are in the coverage. You know, all these things, you know, you couldn't just go to practice and do those. You had to watch a lot of film. Uh, you had to study your opponent. You had to realize that, that your opponent had a tendency to, to blitz from the left on third down. All these things, right? So an elite athlete uh, knows that he or she has got to put a lot of time and energy into their craft to be a master. Um, and so, you know, when you get into sales, sales, whether it's tech sales, pharma sales, copier sales, doesn't matter. If you're going to be elite in sales, you're going to have to put the same level of energy into your preparation, into your education into your knowledge, uh, into seeking best practices from other more tenured and experienced people. Uh, all of these things uh, have to go into your daily sort of vernacular. You wake up, get better. And when you go eat, go eat, eat better to go get better, right? All these things. And so sales is a natural transition for people that are spending their energy day in and day out to be an elite athlete. Those same traits translate perfectly into what it is to be an elite salesperson. And, and elite athletes don't have to be taught that 
coming out of college or coming out of their professional sport or coming out of the military, for example. Same thing about the military. You know, you, you got to be an elite shooter. You got to be elite with your physical therapy. You got to be able to survive out in the wild for X number. What I mean, you know, whatever it is. You know, I, I obviously I, I didn't I didn't grow up. Um, I grew up through the military, but not in it. So I can't quite speak the same vernacular. But but I can tell through my father that you know he he was the, the best of the best as a helicopter pilot. You don't get on presidential duty unless you're the best of the best to care for our number one, right? So so you know being being elite means doing everything possible at every time point uh, to be the best you can, including being the best you can at getting rest, at, at being the best you can at ensuring your mental health, right? So all these things translate naturally into being a great salesperson. Where the second fold is in the in the pharmaceutical li uh, line of thinking. Um, elite athletes are great here too. I've had the pleasure of training thousands of, of, of sales professionals in the pharmaceutical marketplace. Um, and, you know, there were, there were various uh, various people I can think of, you know, that were elite athletes uh, coming out of college or even coming out of the professional ranks that came through our, our doors at uh, at our training class, uh, and they were able to apply the same same skills. There were also various people that were elite salespeople that that maybe didn't necessarily come through sports. So it doesn't mean that you know it doesn't mean that if you're in sports, you're you're a natural you know to be elite. What it means is that you're a natural to put that with the characteristics to be elite, but other people have those things too. So, um, so it's really about harnessing those things. But from a pharmaceutical perspective, um, you know, uh, the, the, the folks I saw that, uh, that were best at their craft, uh, I would call them, they were masters of the pharmaceutical landscape. Let me tell you what I mean by that. They were masters at um, knowing their product inside, outside, left, right, backwards, forwards. They knew the prescribing information. They knew all of it. They knew how that prescribing information impacted the physicians, um, the physicians, um, uh, a patient base. They knew their competition in out, left, right, and backwards. They knew where their individual product uh, had a leg up against the competition, but they also knew where competition had a leg up against their products. They were able to then position their product very specifically to a, to a physician or, or a nurse practitioner, physician assistant, you name it, some sort of prescriber that help the prescriber see where their product would be a benefit. Um, they, they understood the disease state. They didn't just know what they were taught in sales school. They continuously learned. Uh, they continuously read information. They read medical journals. Uh, they read things on their own time, not given to them by the pharmaceutical company that could help them be a master. And that's where athletes, I think, make, make, uh, make great pharma salespeople because, again, like I said, they know all of these characteristics. They've demonstrated these characteristics. It's about you know having the grit and the tenacity to, to not say, okay, I'm an elite athlete. I'm just going to walk in, kiss a baby, and say, oh, yeah, I played against Auburn in the Iron Bowl or I played in the national title game, write my drug. Physicians don't care. They may say, hey, it's great to see you. I remember watching you on TV. But if you don't give them something meaningful that helps them help their patients, they don't care that you're an elite athlete. What they care about is that you can help them help their patients live a healthier life. Uh, and when you can do that by giving them some meaningful tips and tricks on how to prescribe medication for a particular type of disease or a particular type of ailment or a particular side effect that a, a competitive product is struggling with, but your product might be better for, um, that's when somebody who played in the Iron Bowl or somebody who played in the national title game or played in the College World Series, that's where, you know, that becomes meaningful because not only are you somebody that I, I used to know because I watched on TV, but now you're somebody that is used that same um, elite nature to be at the, the best of the best in terms of uh, of, of sales and, and the pharmaceutical landscape or diagnostic device or device space, whatever, to help me realize that I can be a better doctor because I've talked to you. And and when, when you self-actualize with your physician base in that way, you as an individual salesperson have affected thousands and thousands upon thousands of people live a better life. And when you have a physician, stop what they're doing, pull you into their office and say, hey, Mike, I want you to know I prescribed your product for a particular patient type. And that patient is now doing so much better. That patient's living a much higher quality of life. That patient's now walking again, you know, whereas their diabetic peripheral neuropathy was so bad that they're not walking anymore. Or they weren't walking because they couldn't they couldn't feel their foot, but now they can. Um, and by the way, that patient is my father. Thank you so much for giving my dad his life back. You know, when you hear those things, 
you know that you've you, you've made a huge difference. And that's not putting down any other industry. I know tech sales is huge and tech is where the world is going. It's it's amazing what tech is doing or any other, you know, or copiers or anything else. But when you physically, personally change the trajectory of someone's health and quality of life, to me, there's no finer feeling than that. Dude, you got me ready to do pharma sales, buddy. Let's go, man. <laughs> That's awesome. Let's go. Let, so I, I got a really good sense from you, like, because like one of the things that I like, I'm putting myself in a, you know, a 23 year old kid's cleats or skates or whatever. And I'm like, man, like selling to a doctor who's got, you know, years of advanced schooling experience. Like I can't even imagine, you know, it was like me when I was 23 sitting in front of a chief, you know, a, a 60 year old chief information officer trying to sell them technology. But to your point, it's about building that expertise in the product set that you sell, right? They, they, these doctors do a million things, right? They, they, they have thousands of patients with different ailments. You're an expert in your product and the outcomes that you can drive and the, and the kind of characteristics that they need to look for for your product. So that's how you can kind of elevate yourself even at a young and inexperienced age. So that phenomenal there. I want to take a step back though for a second, right? You got a, you know, a college senior or somebody who just got out of military service and they're like, you know, they, 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 they kind of have some interest. Like, okay, this pharma thing seems interesting. What kind of like more general coaching are you going to give that person if, if they have some initial interest in pharmaceutical sales beyond like, hey, talk to shift group, but like what, what else should they be kind of doing and thinking about? Yeah, yeah, great question. You know, I think the first first thing I want to say before I get directly to your, your question is, it took me three years to win my first award. So these things don't happen overnight. Um, there are people that, you know, that, that I've, I've had a chance to work with that, that, um, that have come out of another industry or come out of college. Uh, and they've won, they won maybe rookie of the year, you know, or, or whatever it is in their first year. That wasn't me. It took me a couple years to, to get after it, to really sort of understand and, and, and get it. So it's not something that's, it's not immediate gratification. You don't walk out of sales school at pharma and, and people are, 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 are dropping all, like flies all around you because they just want to write your product. It takes time. Um, so the first thing I would, I think I would answer is, is, um, is be patient, right? And not, not patient with your own characteristics of what makes an elite athlete or an elite salesperson. That has to be, you know, all gas, no brakes immediately, right? But what, but, but the results, it's going to take some time. You know, you don't walk into Dr. Smith's office for the first time, introduce yourself and expect that Dr. Smith is going to say, Oh wow, Mike knows exactly what he's talking about. I better, better, I better write all of his product. It doesn't work that way. It takes time to build credibility. You, you know, sometimes months, years to build credibility. And unfortunately, like anything else, it sometimes only takes seconds to lose it. So you gotta, you gotta really build that credibility, you know, slowly and over time, so they begin to trust you. Uh, you probably heard the, heard the, uh, you know, the, 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 the old ad is, is, is that, uh, you know, you, you, it, it, um, it, it um, uh, trust is earned. Right, it's it's not you know it's not just given. So you got to earn that trust. So um, it, it takes time. So that's the first thing. Second thing would be uh, would be to you know to um, to be in it for the right reasons. You know you you can you can make a lot of money in pharma. I, I've I've made a, a good amount. I've taken well taken care of my family. I know many others that have as well and have made a career out of it. You, there are people that are in their in their forties and fifties. I know that have been a sales representative their entire career, and they've got a portfolio that would blow your mind. Absolutely, I'm talking about a financial portfolio would blow your mind because in the in the in the sales world, you're not just a sales rep. You start off as as a tier, then you get promoted to a senior rep, and then an executive rep, and then you maybe parlay that job into a very specialized position, maybe rare disease. There's such a huge pathway of of, of ways for people to grow in the pharmaceutical representative profession alone. Now, I didn't necessarily do that. I started off as a rep in one company. Parlayed that into another rep with another company, then to another company, and that company, uh, a company was called Salix Pharmaceuticals. I found my home, and that's where I elevated my career into into the home office and into the leadership ranks. So there's there's other ways too, right? So there's so many ways you can build a career. So so the the other way I'll answer your question is 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 that is you can take your career in so many ways, right? If you love to sell and all you want to do is sell, there's an amazing career 
that can make you a significant sum of money for you. If management is something you want to do, there's a significant amount of money you can make with an amazing career of doing that. If you want to get into brand marketing, if you want to get into sales operations, if you want to get into human resources, if you want to, I mean, there's so many ways you can get into uh, a different career path through pharmaceuticals. Like anything else, pharmaceuticals is, is a self-contained operation. They have every type of, of skill and person that's in it, not just salespeople. So, so, um, so get in and figure out what you want to do and, and just have an open mind. But the, the biggest thing is, like anything else, get into the industry, be coachable. Be coachable just like you were in your profession. Be coachable just like you were with your, your gunnery sergeant. Be coachable just like you were with, you know, with, uh, with your, your sports compliance teams, the NCAA compliance, all that. If they give you some feedback, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, take it and apply it. Um, JR, I can't tell you how many times I, I gave some coaching and feedback and I had the bobblehead. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then they had no intention of applying that coaching. And you start to see right <laughs> through those things. And that's when the coach in me, I just quit coaching you. I just don't spend any time with you because what's the point, right? So right. if someone's going to be coachable, yeah. and being coachable is not bobblehead. Being coachable is, is, is listening, understanding, and then applying that information, right? And if you're coachable in the pharmaceutical world and you're somebody that wants to learn from others, and you're not somebody that thinks that you're you're a, a, a you're a bad mother, and your people are just going to just fall at your feet because because of who you used to be. But you instead want to learn from people that are more tenured, more seasoned, uh, have, have won awards. You're going to win awards too. It's just the way it is. Um, I, I've also run into people that they get a pharma job and they think, oh, I'll just sort of get this nice cushy job. I'll get a company car and I'll just stay off the radar, you know, and I'll just be somebody in the middle. Um, pharmaceuticals is uh, is a very spotlight industry. If you're great at what you do, or if you want to be great, aspire to be great and get to be great, your name's going to be in lights all the time. And if you're staying off the radar and you're going to be middle of the road, you're never going to be in lights. And it's going to be obvious that you're never in lights. And it's going to be very hard for you to find, you yeah. know, find work, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a specialized pharmaceutical world. Um, so if you, if you're an athlete or you're a, you're a veteran and you are great at what you do and you want to be great somewhere, it's very clear that you're great in pharma because your prescription revenue generating data is very obvious and transparent. You know how you're doing week in and week out. You know how you're doing month in and month out. Are you generating prescription value? Yes or no. And if you are, it's very obvious. So if you want to be elite, you want to be known as elite, pharma is a great place to be elite as well, you know, um, because you've got that that prominence in the data. So um, it'll, you know, the cream always rises to the top, JR. Uh, you know that, I know it, and it's no different in farming. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's no there's no participation trophies in sales. The participation nope. trophy is go find another job. Yep. <laughs> um, you, you, you started that. Um, that was awesome. And you started with talking about, like, the importance of patience. I saw this thing uh, recently about being aggressively patient. And what they mean by that is like, you know, you, you, uh, this is a weird analogy, but like you can't have a baby faster by getting nine women pregnant, right? It's going right. to take the time it's going to take. You've got to, the way you have to approach your career is like, let it take the time it's going to do. But that doesn't mean that you stop, um, you stop working towards your goals, and you're aggressively working towards your goals and you're aggressively doing those activities. It's going to take you to reach your goals. So um, I, I really love the the start of that um, with the patience, because I think you're right. It's, it's just thinking about that patience in the right way. Um, now, uh, a topic that I want to hit with you, Mike, because we ask uh, everybody about this, um, and, and I don't know the answers. I know the answers in tech, or I have opinions in tech. I don't have opinions in pharma. If 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 we got a, a candidate and we put them in front of a couple companies, um, what are the things that they should be looking for uh, to pick the right type of company to start their career, like that first pharma job? What what does good look like? Oh man, that's a loaded one. Um, there's a couple of, of easy answers. Um, I, I think, of course, others that are viewing this episode may have some additional uh, information, and I welcome hearing these things too. 
Uh, but but the, for the for the person that's getting into pharma, you want to pick a company that has two main characteristics. One, the person that's going to hire you, are they going to invest in you, right? So your direct manager, are they going to put the time and energy, and do they have the joy to put time and energy into you that's going to help cultivate uh, your energy, your uh, the, the characteristics that made you an elite athlete, are they going to help you harness those towards the right trajectory in pharma sales? Um, if, if you if you have a, a supervisor that that wants to hire somebody and, and leave them alone and let them go do their thing, that's not going to be the best place for you starting off. You want somebody that's very hands on. Uh, we hear the term micromanagement. You know that's used so out of context so many times, but sometimes it's used properly. Whatever the case, you, you don't want to micromanage, but you want somebody that's going to going to be micro focused on your development, right? So you want a company that's the, that the person that's gonna hire you, you wanna really interview that person to make sure that they are gonna be someone that's gonna invest in you. Because I've seen careers burn because somebody wants to get into it in the industry and they have a, a, a manager that, um, you know, that, that doesn't put the time and energy, they're on their last leg, maybe they're close to retirement, they're just sort of just going through the motions themselves. And, and, then, and then sales reps get off to a, a really, really tough start because they don't have the direction. They don't have somebody that has the patience with them to cultivate them. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is you, you want to look for a company that, that, um, that has, actually, I guess three things. You want a second one. You look for a company that has a good portfolio, being a good, good batch of products. Maybe the company only has one product. Is that product a good product? You know, and, and if you know a couple of doctors or you have some friends that are nurses or, you know, or whatever the case may be, ask them. Hey, I'm interviewing with company XYZ. This is their product. Is it any good? And if they say, oh my gosh, it's a dog. It's the 15th drug of its kind. You know, it's a tough sell. Um, you know, it, it, we don't really use it. That's going to be tough because then you're going to go in with the mentality of, geez, how in the world do I sell something that people really, you know, don't really need to use or want to use, right? Um, so you want to look for a company that's got a good product. You know, is it new or new-ish or, or does it have a very specific, you know, uh, patient a, a segment that this this is the top drug for something like that whether it's single product or portfolio products uh, and, and even if the products are on the market do they have a future right do they do they are they do they have um you know some more um some more patent life attached to them um you know are they going to be around for a little while sometimes people get jobs with pharma companies at the end of their their drugs patent life and then when the patent expires various generics come to market and then that company folds because they didn't they don't have any other drugs and now they can't sell that drug because generics are getting all of the market share. So you want to make sure it has some patent life. Uh, the portfolio does. Um, and then, and then, and then the third thing is: does the is, is the company poised for growth? Do they have a, a strong pipeline? Do they have other assets uh, that are being developed by that company that could soon come to market? Um, you know, you, and, and ultimately that means that that uh, that that you'll be selling maybe drugs one and two today, but maybe in six to twelve months. You'll be selling drugs three and four also, or it could mean that the company is going to double in size, you know, and create two sales forces. When that happens, it's great because the best salespeople get preference on what sales force they want to, what they, they want to, they want to be a part of, or maybe if they want to get into sales management, you know, they get a chance to be a part a sales manager, you know, on that new sales force, you know, and there's, there's opportunities that arise. I think, I think JFK said back in the fifties or sixties, a rising tide floats all boats. So when a company is, is growing, and there are new assets, you know, that the Food and Drug Administration is approving. That's that's a rising tide. And if you're good at what you do, you're going to be you're going to benefit from that rising tide floating all boats. Now, you know, the mediocre or the, the, the or the marginal players, they're going to their boats are going to rise, too. But they're not going to rise near as fast or near as lucratively as somebody who's elite at what they do. So those are, I think, three things. You know, do you have a manager that's going to invest in you? Uh, does your, do, you have, do you have a company that's got a good product or products? And does that company have some good assets coming in the future? Um, you know, yeah. here's the thing. Some people um, don't always have that luxury. You know, I guess the, the, the three B would be if you want to get into this industry, just get in. Just get in. Because here's the thing. Even if you wind up, you know, only hitting on one or two of those criteria, you got a good boss, but maybe the drugs aren't all that awesome. Get in because you're going to be ranked against your peers at that company. If you're better than yeah. them, you're going to show performance. Even if it may be hard to sell that drug, you're going to be better than them. And then yeah. that gives you the ability to then say to that company, hey, I'm killing it. 
You know, are there other things I can I can do to grow? You know, are there other is is there a pathway I can grow? Um, you know, maybe I can run a sales management or some other area. Um, and, and and or other another case, you could take your sales results and then you know one two three years down the road interview with a company that does more fit that criteria and say, hey, look, I went to a tough company, killed it. I'm going to be a rock star for you. And 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 those people tend to get to get those jobs too because they've been able to show documented sales performance and in particularly in the face of some adversity. So so sometimes it's just about getting in, uh, right? So don't 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 feel like if you've got a, a company that may be struggling or, or whatever it may be, get in, be prepared, uh, learn the disease state, learn the drugs before the interview. So you go in prepared to, to show somebody what you're made of. Use those same elite characteristics to prepare just as you did for game day. And that's that's uh, that's something that I advise I would give to somebody that's breaking into the market. I love it. Um it's actually very similar to the advice we give in 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 the space. We we I focus like a probably a little bit less on the product and emphasize a little bit more on 3B because it's like you know, you got these these young people who are told to follow their passion and they're usually told by people that have done really well in a space that they weren't passionate about when they were 23 years old and it's bull it's bullshit advice. It's like, no, don't you go do something um, that you can enjoy doing and you'll develop a passion for yep. it over time. And then to your point, right, it's like get in the space. You know, nobody's passionate about, you know, cybersecurity, just like I'm sure there's very few people that are passionate about, you know, specific, you know, drug verticals. But again, like you you have to go develop that that foundation. And, and the most important part of developing that foundation, to your point, is your first leader the person that is going to kind of set you in the right direction, show you what good looks like for you to follow. And that it goes, I would say, I would argue that goes for every single sales job in every single industry is the first person you work for is the most important. My first boss actually texted me this morning, really great text. Um, and I just, I thanked him again. I'm like, Hey man, like I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if it wasn't for you. So that's awesome, dude. And I love that there's similarities there. Um, we're get we're starting to get towards the end here, uh, Mike. Um, so like I'm gonna kind of combine a couple questions. Um I I, I wanna ask you, because we ask everybody this, right? Like you've had a ton of success in your career. Okay. Um obviously there's 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 many skills that make great pharmaceutical sales reps. I wanna know. From your perspective, maybe maybe list a few, but then talk about like which skill made you elite specifically. Like if you had to pick one, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a that can be a tough one. Um, you know, I, I'll start by answering this way, and I'll be as be as brief as possible because I know I can I get passionate about this stuff. Um, you know, the, <laughs> just, just simply just simply be, being a master. Um, you know, I, I, where, where I had my success was learning as much as I could learn, having an insatiable desire for learning more, um, you know, and, and being wide open to others' feedback. Uh, I, you know, I, I guess I'll, I've mentioned this a little bit earlier, but, but I've seen people that had all the skills, but they're closed to other ways of doing things, and they can only get so far. When they run into a, you know, a, a particular objection or problem in their, in their, in their uh, profession, they may not have the the, the, the sizable tool belt to be able to successfully sell through it. However, if you're open, you know, you're not somebody that's going to come in and say, I'm elite. I know what I'm doing. Even two and three years in, you know, I, I even, even now I mean, I'm 20, 20, what am I? 22 years into the industry. You know, I'm still learning things, still learning new ways of doing things, better ways of selling things, whatever it may be. And so, so as you get into the industry, uh, having that, that insatiable desire to grow and learn includes being open to best practices from some of your peers that you might be competing with those for those competing with for those top awards. I mean, you may, maybe you and six other people competing for rep of the year. If if you're if you if you respect them and you're friends with them uh, and you've got this attitude of I'm going to share my best practice with you, you share your best practice with me. Together, we're going to be better and we're going to build this company. Um, that's a much better attitude than. I'm going to be closed off and keep my secrets to myself because then that that doesn't inspire people to share their secrets with you. 
So, um, so that's, that's something that I think all salespeople, not just pharma, if they, if they would just be more open to competition amongst their peers uh, and be more vulnerable uh, with sharing, you're going to inspire more people to share with you. Then you build a network of elite people around you. And you, we've all heard it. Iron sharpens iron, right? You know, if you're around iron, you're going to, you're, you're going to be much sharper than if you were, you were, you were not. So I think that's the way I'd answer that question. I love it. That's awesome. And and I think you probably answered the last question too, which is like, we always say the, the, the highest praise you can give someone in sales is calling them a pro. And what I heard you say is like, listen, to really be a pro, you need like a lifelong intellectual curiosity and a lifelong kind of coachability muscle. Like you've got to always be learning and you've got to always be willing to like, to not, it's not even necessarily feedback. You're going to get feedback from leaders, but it's like, when I say coachable, it's like seeing someone else do something or hearing about someone else do something, realizing that it's really good and having the, the kind of humbleness to go, I'm going to do that. Like, that's really good. I'm going to use that. So it feels like those two things kind of summarize what a pro means to you. Would, would you say that's fair? Yeah, Mark? absolutely. Absolutely fair. I, you know, the other, other way I would put it is, you know, you're right. You're going to get feedback, but what I, a pro seeks feedback. You know, when they're not getting, we're not getting feedback, they're going to seek it. Um, you know, at every opportunity, what can I do to improve? How could that have been better? Um, you know, you, I get a kick out of an old story, and it's this one's this one's pretty well documented in the uh, in the National Football League. It, it was, and I won't name names because I know this audience can be broad. But there was a particular uh, first round draft pick that uh, was a quarterback and never watched film. Uh, now nobody knew that I know. Uh, until I know the game story. play. Uh, yeah. But but ultimately that you know when the when when the game was on, there was some things like, wow, did he not watch film? So they sent him blank game tapes and they said, hey, what'd you think about the tape? And the the quarterback would say, oh yeah, I watched it. It was great. You know, the reality was he never put it in because there was nothing on it, right? And so so it, it's somebody that's <laughs> going to really seek that feedback, seek to grow, and not just say, hey, I'm elite. I'm the best. They were, they drafted me, so I'm the best. It's about somebody you know who uh, who's who's going to seek feedback and that, that, that again that insatiable uh, desire to improve, right? Uh, you know, I, I mean, it's you know, in, in in the football world, you know, Tom Brady is a great example because I remember years ago, I guess it was 02, 03, They said, "Hey, which of which are your Super Bowls? What's your favorite?" He said, you know, "Or which of your Super Bowl rings is your favorite?" He said, he "said the answer was his ne the next one." Right. It was clear that he he had that insatiable desire to improve and his career is, you know, is well documented. Right. Same thing. Same thing applied in sales. If you're continually striving for improvement and you're doing what it takes and you're doing everything you can, that's what I would call a profession day in and day out. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Dude, this was awesome, Mike. I'm, I'm like, this is like just so awesome for the for the candidates that are going to start coming into our program and getting a taste from, you know, from you and from others in terms of what the opportunity is in pharmaceutical sales. And then we're going to work hard to give them the same type of foundational skill, skill work um, to, to make not, not just, you know, get them a job, but make them successful in that first job. So I, this is going to be a great preview for, for what's ahead for those people. Um, and, and I think it's going to win some hearts and minds of folks that are on the bubble of which industry to to choose so thank you so much for your time thank well, you so much for joining the episode and thank you so much for for working with me to to expand this program for for our company i really appreciate you yeah you, you got it hats off to the shift group you know and and i look forward to to uh, to seeing what the shift group can accomplish you know and in, in its growth in, in, in various verticals so thanks for allowing me to be part of it really enjoyed it today thanks jr thanks mike this wraps up this episode of Merchants of Change. If you enjoyed this episode, the most meaningful way to say thanks is to submit a review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're interested in working with us, please come find us at www.shiftgroup.io.